Hey everyone, wherever you are, I hope you're having a wonderful week so far. We're here with the latest episode of the Inside Crypto Show, interviews and discussion with regular people just like yourselves. Today we're joined by somebody finally in relatively my time zone, Tim Boss. He is an experienced blockchain engineer and entrepreneur who has founded several successful sharing economy and IoT related companies, including global car sharing platform Kias, and Tim can probably correct me on the pronunciation of that, which has offices in Australia, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and the USA. Tim, thank you so much for making time, especially after you told me what happened to you before. I really appreciate it. Let's talk about your background. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So I, without going into too much detail, I started my first startup as like a, while I was at university, teaching people how to use the internet. <laughs> so this is going back a long time, back in 1995, rented out the computer room at my university and started up just teaching people all about the internet and how good it's going to be and all that sort of stuff. So I, I guess my passion for the web two or the internet started many years ago. I worked in consulting jobs. I worked for Avenar, the joint venture with Microsoft and Accenture. And I left there to start my own proper business in around 2004 and just really got the bug and it was a big risk just jumping away and doing that sort of stuff so started a gps business so we're doing tracking of racehorses and then that actually pivoted to tracking cars sold that and then started keys in 2013 we exited that company a few years ago to a, a german-based company called wonder and started sharing in early 2018 so my sort of appeal or my an interest in blockchain technology really came about in around 2010. A mate of mine, Rowan, suggested I start mining this thing called Bitcoin. And I grabbed a laptop at my work at that time and loaded up a Bitcoin wallet and started mining it through a laptop back then. And I mined a few, but I've got no idea where that wallet is, <laughs> like many other early sort of miners. And then back in 2000, around 2016 is when I really started getting interested in the technology of it and what made it work. Smart contracts, the white paper had come out just put a little while before that. And this idea of actually having this concept of this distributed virtual machine and this trustless sort of environment really appealed to me. And it wasn't until 2017, I realized there's something there that we could really build a business on and solve a lot of problems that we had when we were running our car sharing business. And that's how sharing was basically created. Very cool. Looking at your background, like you have the sort of entrepreneurial streak, but at the same time, you also have this technical background. Out of curiosity, do you favor more the entrepreneurial side? Or do you favor more the te technical side? Or do you find yourself stuck between both worlds? I actually, my passion really comes through innovation. So. For me, it's the tech, right? I wake up in the morning and I still read like Slashdot and Ars Technica and TechCrunch and those sorts of things because I'm interested in just new stuff. I get excited when I read that there's a, finally a breakthrough in called Fusion or things like that. When we look at making things, we make stuff that excites me, like stuff that I'm actually passionate about doing, but also things that solve real world problems. So I guess the technical side is more interesting to me. A good example is like when I started Keys and also BioWatch, the first thing I did is actually look for a CEO because the running of the company and the day-to-day -day sort of run the business stuff is less interesting to me than building cool things. So it's, I'm more of a techie than an entrepreneur, I guess. Very cool. And then you mentioned the GPS on the horses and cars. So what made you get interested in the sharing economy? Because a lot of people might look at it, they're like, this is cool, but at the same time, it's not that interesting. Like what drove yeah. your interest and passion for the sharing economy? So sharing economy for us, one of the things we noticed or that I noticed in the world is the amount of waste that we had and how do we do more with less? And I was going to start a startup with a friend of mine, Darren, years ago called Rentals and actually renting tools and all that sort of stuff. We did market research and realized there wasn't really much in that. I also started a company called Caramavan, which I sold to an ASX Australian stock exchange listed company back in 2010, I think. And that was really just a hobby business where we had a caravan and wanted to rent it out and we put other people on the platform, built it up from there. So we, we lived and breathed the sharing economy for a number of years. We sold our car, we lived off car sharing, we rented out a caravan, we didn't get so involved with the Airbnbs and things like that. But for us, it was about saying, like it was more of a lifestyle thing. And then the more that we did it, the more we noticed that there was problems in that whole industry that could be solved. And it, it was really the basis for these problems that sharing was started. And since then, it's sharing's turned more into less of a sharing economy, more of an identity-based company, just because 
if you look at a lot of the core problems with the sharing economy, you actually manage to boil a lot of it down to identity and trust. And that's really where we focus the foundations on the platform that we're basically built is really around the identity side of things and the trust side of things and the ownership of your information side of things. Because you look at companies like Airbnb, how many times have they been hacked and your data's been leaked? I don't want to single them out because there's, you could probably name just about every sharing economy where they've had some sort of leak or they mine your data or they do stuff with your data that you don't want them to do and so on. Nice and very good point. Like you, you literally just transitioned into our very first question. So before we continue, I want to remind everyone that anything Tim says or I say does not constitute financial or legal advice. Our opinions are our own and not to be connected with our respective organizations. So everyone, please do your own research. Tim, let's hit it off with that identity question. I have had one other company come on and talk about identities and digital identities. And I guess my big question for you is like, everyone's so familiar with the sort of SO, right? Or single sign-on where you go to a website, you click sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook, or you might be in mm -hmm. Korea, it would be sign in with Naver or Line or that sort of stuff, depending where you live. So what's the difference between what sharing is trying to do and this sort of sign-on technology? Are you guys trying to do the same thing? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I guess it comes down to, for us, we basically have this vision of providing frictionless access to goods and services worldwide. And basically for us, the mission behind that is really around this frictionless everyday interaction, but also allowing the users to maintain the highest level of security trust and ownership and control of their information. So if you go back to your question, you look at say a Google or a Facebook and they signal sign on, as soon as you sign up to them and provide information about you, they have that data, they own that data, right? So you sign up through say Google, they track everything that you do. You put your, you use Google pay to add your credit card information. They have that, you add your driver's license information, your passport information, your home address, all of this information is sitting on their servers, right? So it, it doesn't matter how good the security is on that. There is always a risk that someone else is going to get that, or you don't know whether or, not, or like what they're doing that information. Look at Facebook with the Cambridge Analytica stuff that was a, a number of years ago. There, there are lots of examples where your data has been used for nefarious purposes and you've lost complete control over that. Our approach is really more of a self-sovereign approach. And we look at sort of identity, but also verifiable credentials where we've created something called the vault, which sits on your phone. And the vault contains information about your identity. So verified identity, it contains any other verifiable credentials you might want to add. So it could be proof of address, it could be your vaccination history, it could be medical records, it could be graduation certificates or any of that sort of stuff that sits in a vault. And what we do is we use blockchain technology to basically create a digital hash of that information, which means that even though you have complete control over it, once it's verified, you can't change it. If you try to change one pixel or the photo on the passport or your date of birth or something like that, it no longer matches the hash that's stored on the blockchain. So that's where trust comes into it. So when I send, say, you a bit of information about myself to access something, so a minimum amount of information you require to make a decision as to whether or not I can access your service, you know that information hasn't changed. So we create trust between the two of us, yet I still have complete control over my information and who I'm sharing it with. So we believe you can use that to get the same level, if not better level of service as compared to the Googles and the Facebooks where they have that single sign on mechanism. And we add the sort of the trust, the security, the control of your personal information to that, but also the ability to have more information about yourself stored on that vault. Okay. And thinking back on what you said, this is stored on my phone and I have control over it. And you said self-sovereignty, this goes into the idea of self-custody as well. You control yep. your money, your identity and stuff. But what about the typical pushback people give about this is that people are faulty, people drop phones into lakes or other bad things and that sort of stuff. Like if I'm using sharing and something bad happens to my phone, what is the backup? Have I lost all of this information that's on there? So when you first set it up, so when you create your vault, you have an option to set up a backup process. So you can back it up to your personal cloud drive. You can back it up to a network drive in your office or anything like that. So you can choose where that vault's backed up. The vault and all the data within it is encrypted with your public key. So the seed phrase that you create, you actually encrypt that with your public key. So you can only decrypt it with seed phrase to get access to that information. So the most important part as with anything blockchain is the seed phrase. So 
we go to great lengths to make sure that people actually back up that phrase so that if they lose their phone or something like that's fine they simply enter their seed phrase they restore the vault from backup they're ready to go i use the vault for a lot of stuff that we've been developing and my phone while i was in london in november my phone was snatched out of my hand so it was stolen and for me the first thing i thought about is oh all my data is in the vault and then i'm like okay, I trust our technology. So I know that unless someone had my biometric information, they couldn't unlock my vault. So I knew it was completely safe. I went to the phone store, I bought a new phone and I was actually up and running within a couple of hours. I'm probably a bit more paranoid and security conscious than a lot of other people. So in terms of the attack vectors that come from someone stealing, my phone is very low because everything's behind the password or biometric. I've got a backup phone at home that I restored from and so on. But it's a good example. We just proved that the whole technology works instead in terms of lost my phone or broke my phone and so on. Talking more about this. So I'm someone, right? Let's take this scenario. I'm someone, I'm listening to this podcast on Apple somewhere. I found it and I'm like, okay, this is really interesting. How do you want users or potential customers or institutions or organizations to say, okay, this is really cool. Let's go the sort of retail 101 and the institutional side. Like, what do you want them sure. to do after listening to this podcast? Yes, so effectively as a company, we've got two business divisions. One of those that we call Sharing Foundation. So the idea of sharing foundation is basically the underlying blockchain technology, client libraries, APIs, and all that we're built on top of that. What we're doing is we're inviting builders to come and build on that blockchain identity related um, products. So we've got things like the ability to create things like soul bound tokens. We've got something we call the vault query language, which is a JavaScript language. that allows you to query or ask questions of data that's in the vault through a QR code that can be scanned. What we're launching that with our first hackathon that we're about to launch, which invites people to build on that blockchain. The other business division, which we call sharing business solutions is where we're connecting with companies to basically work with them and integrate what we've done with the vault and the SDKs that we've got, which an SDK is like a, um, it's, it's like a program that we've developed that can be embedded in other people's apps. So basically through these SDKs and the business relationships, we're starting to embed the vault into their business processes. So various companies of all sizes, it could be. A, a ticketing company for events that needs to get ID linked to their tickets. It could be a, a food delivery company that needs to prove that you're over 18 before they deliver food. It could be a 7-Eleven store that needs to verify your age when you pick up the stuff. It could be any sharing economy, like a car sharing company or something like that, that needs to onboard users. So the range of companies and industries is quite broad in terms of what we're inviting. And what we do is we work with them with the APIs, the Vault Query language, and the other tools that we've got to put the right process in place for them to have a better identity solution and also remove friction for their clients. And what about people, like regular people that are like, okay, I'm gonna start using this. What is the best yes. way to start using this? So you can download the sharing app from the app store now. So you can create your own vault and use that. One of the things that we've developed with the vault is through the SDK, you can actually have multiple apps on your phone using the same vault, so sharing the same vault. It's a huge amount of effort that's gone behind actually doing that. So it's sign up once use across different apps within the ecosystem. So you might have Acme Industries creates their own app using our SDK and that will have the vault and you'll have the sharing app using the vault as well. And they both share the same vault. So they can download the vault. We are about to launch some new features that gives them some real genuine utility for that. So all I can say is the hack that LastPass had would be a thing of the past with one of the small utilities we're ad actually adding to, to our app very shortly. So we're going to be inviting some beta testers onto that there. Other than that, someone can download the app, they can get access to the Vault Query Language dashboard, and then actually start creating their own queries and building out their own sort of products based on that. Or they can get direct access to a blockchain, start building smart contracts that leverage your identity. Some of the zero knowledge proof stuff with the soulbound tokens that come from identity as well. Very cool. Tim, so being a crypto podcast, we have to ask what blockchain technology are you using? Is it your own blockchain mm -hmm. or what is it based off of? Your chance to be as technical as you want. Great. So we made a decision back in 2018. We looked at many blockchains and look, we looked at building on Ethereum. We looked at back then there was like Waves and EOS was launching and a bunch of blockchains. And we effectively had a number of requirements around what we would build on. And one of them was um, transaction numbers because we were looking initially 
at some sharing economy stuff. We looked at assets. We wanted to store lots of assets on the blockchain in terms of the rentals, transaction volume. We also looked at transaction pricing. So one of the one of the plans we always had was when we dealt with um, real world clients, not just in the Web3 world, they expect pricing that is predictable and they expect to be able to pay in say US dollars a fixed amount for transactions and things like that. So that eliminated pretty much every blockchain because when you're dealing with gas fees that go from a dollar to five dollars and down again and that sort of stuff, you can't have a predictable business model based on gas fees if you're just having users sign up to a service, right? So we made the decision to build on Tendermint at the time, which is effectively part of the Cosmos ecosystem. So we've built on Tendermint, which has become the Cosmos SDK, and effectively Share Ledger is really built on that. And it was a great decision. We're super happy that we did that. So we've got two modules that we've built within it, one that we call internally Gentlemint, and that actually allows us to take the current exchange rate of our token and charge clients in a US dollar value and then use the token exchange rate to distribute the number of tokens to the node holders that creates predictable pricing model for people that use that part of our system. And then we also have the smart contracts engine, Cosmosm that we launched, which is a Rust-based smart contracts engine that uses standard gas-based pricing. So we've got the best of both worlds. We've got a very, very high number of transactions per second, very scalable in terms of number of assets and number of tasks that you can put on the blockchain. So for us, what is it, four, four or five years on, it's a tip. We've made the right decision in terms of what we're doing. We haven't even thought about looking at other chains since then. That's great. And you're not the first Cosmos app we've actually talked about it recently. And that, that's good to hear that Cosmos is doing so well. Let's take a huge step back from where we're going with this conversation. One of the things I wanted to ask, because you're based in Australia, I'm based in Taiwan, right? The sharing economy is different, I would say somewhat different around the world, right? That there are generally a lot of common threads there. I assume sharing is launching in Australia first, or is this going to be a global thing? Like, how's this all going to work? No. So given that our, the core focus has come down to the identity level, so it's not strictly sharing economy type companies, we're actually working on proof of concepts and in discussions with those in a number of places around the world. So it's not limited to Australia or anything like that. And all of those opportunities are focused on the core identity product. There's one that is in the sharing economy, so it's car sharing. And then the others are focused purely on on leveraging the identity and what we've done with the Vault product. So I, I can't say exactly where they are at this stage because they're under non-disclosure, but it's Australia, there's Asia, and then also in Caribbean as well. And then the, the other part that we're working on, which is huge, is basically making sure that the identity layer of our products is accredited to certain standards as well. So actually getting proper accreditation for these, which would be one of the first that, that is a, actually probably the first soft sovereign identity that's accredited to a government level as well. That's really cool. Like, I guess I'd like to ask this question since you mentioned the identity layer and credit to sovereign governments. I think a lot of people around the world are familiar with the idea of e-government and Estonia is really famous for that. Do you think sharing could be helping out governments in that aspect of saying, hey, here's a digital solution to protect your citizens' identities and yeah. this sort of very convenient way to go around. We have national health insurance here in Taiwan, which is a separate card. And like, I have these two cards, which I carry around with me here in Taiwan all the time, which is a kind of pain. I'd love everything to just be on my phone. Is this a possibility in the future? hundred percent. So that's definitely a discussions that we are having at the moment. This whole idea that where you've got a, a government that issues a card and that card is very good and very useful when you're physically going into places to show it to someone. But when you try to access online services and digital services and things like that, that's where it stalls. And the idea where you can actually bring that and turn it into a digital identity that's self-sovereign that can be used within that country, but also outside of that country, the value in that for the end user is phenomenal. It just opens up so many opportunities with digital businesses that can open, go online, they can provide a better service to, to their clients and so on. And then also reduce the risk to their clients in terms of data loss and data leakage. Okay. You mentioned LastPass, right? And one of the things I remember when I was researching for this show was, was I looked at your Twitter and you said user data is heavily protected. And I just wanted to get some clarity, like what does heavily protected mean? We don't store it. So I, I think the, the beauty of what we do is when somebody signs up for our service, the only thing that we have is name and email address. 
we have no other information about them. So that means in terms of attack vectors, if someone was to attack the blockchain, there's no PII, personal information on that. If someone was to attack us, they get a name and email address. It's not exactly a huge deal. So the attack vectors, the centralized attack vectors are virtually zero. There's a decentralized attack vector, which means that if they want my information, they'd need to figure out how to get access to my specific vault on my specific phone. But that means they're only getting one user's information. So in the case of LastPass, they basically had a centralized database of everyone's password files. And granted, they're heavily encrypted. You can only get through it with master password. But I've read a number of articles basically looking at what it would take to brute force those. And eventually, they will be cracked. And some of those people that use LastPass probably aren't going to change their passwords and are probably leaving themselves open to being hacked. So we want to take that option off the table altogether. We want to eliminate the chance of that actually happening by effectively decentralizing the whole, the whole thing. Okay. That's very interesting. And as you were talking, I'm trying to think one of the things like, I think you're a little bit older than me, but I remember you used to get passwords to, to your email and then we moved on to passwords to your cell phone and passwords to email. And then yeah. we've moved on to Google Titan security keys or UB keys. Does sharing remove the need for like multi-factor or triple factor authentication? Could we just move into a universe that, where I just use my sharing vault for everything? Yeah, I mean, you could you can use, so if I'm going to a website, you can use your phone as, and your fingerprint or your face match as your multi-factor authentication, but you can also completely eliminate passwords altogether. So your seed phrase, which you've got stored in a lock and key in a vault somewhere is the only password, right? So effectively use face match or, or, think, or the biometrics. We've got some of our internal products basically use OAuth2 mechanism for sign in and we ourselves now use the sharing app to scan a QR code, use our fingerprint, it authenticates us into our dashboard and I get access to things depending on my access levels. We also do the same when we're authorizing payments within the company. We use the sharing app, we scan the QR code, we basically do that. We're effectively eating our own dog food, a term in a tech industry meaning we're, we're using our own products to do these amazing things. And in, in that sense, we don't have passwords, they're gone. And, and the same as other companies will be launching the ability for them to take some simple JavaScript, put it on their website, and then allow people to log in with the sharing ID to just use their fingerprints and have no passwords. And the good thing about that is it's less risk for the user, but it's also much, much less risk for the companies that are providing that service because they're not putting themselves at risk by hosting hashed or unhashed passwords on their servers or that additional information. Just on a sort of small segue, I've been speaking to a number of insurance companies. We were going through cyber risk insurance process. And the message that we got back is some companies can't be insured now purely because of the data that they're storing. So the risk is getting higher and higher where it's either too expensive to get cyber risk insurance. They simply can't be insured because of the PI that they're storing on their server. You just set off a light bulb in my head. I'm like thinking, oh yeah insurance right cyber risk insurance like that could be a thing for when you have such a secure level that what sharing is bringing to the table right you can mm. drastically reduce business expenses around cyber insurance and i think a lots of companies would love that especially companies who do store huge amounts of data not even from the corporate level from the government level where i remember we had this story in taiwan where our national health insurance provider for 24 million people had leaked someone had leaked people's data or something like that. And that was all been all over the newspaper like two weeks ago. Yeah, that's mm. fantastic. So you are the second project who is doing this, this digital identity thing. And I'm wondering, what do you think is the most unique thing you are bringing to the table besides this digital vault or well, whatever it is? What's this thing that you feel like, oh my God, this is awesome. This is going to change. Well, this is the thing that I want people to be excited about because I'm listening to you talk. I'm excited already. But what is that thing for you? I think for us is the fact that we're building the tools to allow this to become ubiquitous across many companies. What we see in terms of other identity companies, they're basically saying, we've created this app that's for identity and you all need to use this app. But for us, we take the approach where this company, ABC Corp, they want to maintain their branding. They want people to sign up through their app. They want people to basically go through their portal and all that sort of stuff. We're like, okay, so... That's fine. Just grab our SDK, put it into our app. It's powered by sharing. 
you get your branding, you get to have all your things like that in the app and you're completely vertically integrated in terms of what you're offering to your clients in terms of your branding. Same with the website. They use our Vault query language to create questions to clients through QR codes and they maintain all their branding. So the tools that we've got coming out now, basically allowing people to build their own identity products on the foundations that we've built, that's what I'm really excited about. Because you look at back when many years ago, Google released Google Maps and they opened up their API and the back end and the stuff that people built with it were beyond the dreams of what Google expected. Like the things that people, like these mashups that people were creating with Google Maps and things like that. I've got this vision where when we open our build program and the hackathons, people are going to start doing that. People are going to come up with new, unique, innovative ways to use our technology and the ID and the vault and all that that we haven't even thought of yet. Nice. I mean, a quick question on the build side of things, right? Because a lot of programs or protocols, they have incentivization programs for people to build. I used to teach programming to kids three jobs ago. So I think one of the things I found is like when I started working crypto and blockchain technology was I spoke to some of these kids who are now in university studying programming more officially. It's like they find it hard to get into Solidity, hard to get into Rust. For them to start working with sharing or, hey, this is interesting. Is it easy to start building with sharing from the technical programming side? They can build on a few different layers. So if they do know Rust, and I guess if you've got a bit of a background in C+, Rust isn't so hard to move into. It's not as easy as Solidity because you've got JavaScript's quite easy to move to Solidity and so on. But So it is a bit more difficult but it's, it does compile to a lot, a lot of lower level and more efficient. So that's fine. We do also have, and we've got the documentation on beta at the moment where we're releasing it publicly shortly, all the APIs that you can use and we've got the SDK. So there are different levels that somebody could get involved with. So the SDK is built around React Native, which is quite a simple a framework to basically operate within if they want to use the APIs directly, that's even easier. So yeah, it depends on what level they want to get involved in and how deep they want to go on the technology they're building. But if you've got basic development knowledge, then I don't think it's going to be too hard. If you don't, but you've got a really good idea, come to us or find or work with a developer or find a developer that can actually work with you to build out those ideas as well. But the important thing is we're here to help. If somebody does have really good ideas or something like that and they do approach us, we, we generally are, are positive with our responses in terms of helping them with the tools that they need to develop. Nice. I've, I've, got, I've got more questions, but I don't want to keep you for too long. I'm pretty sure it's about lunchtime in Australia, I would imagine. 1.30 p.m. Oh, God, it's, we're yeah, over lunchtime. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> no worries. But, I mean, you've covered a lot of the essential points, a lot of the technical stuff too, which is where we rarely get to talk about on this podcast. I'm so glad you actually made time for it. Tim, any final thoughts about sharing for 2023? Anything you want to be like, hint, hint, this is what's coming this year because you've you hinted <laughs> at a few things. Any Anything you'd want to leave our listeners and viewers for this episode? Yeah, just one thing I'll add. One, one of the things that you mentioned in your last question was developers getting rewarded for building on platforms. And there is one thing we're building in and are going to be releasing soon. And it's basically a reward mechanism that's built into the gas pricing of the smart contracts. So where you've got chains like Ethereum and most of the other chains, where if a developer actually wants to get rewarded for the things that they're building, generally they need to make a token and then they launch that token. And it's the token just as a mechanism to try to get money out of it. So using the real utility of, a, of most of the tokens that are out there. So what we've actually done is we've got these reward program where the owner of a smart contract. So if I build a smart contract for the usage of that smart contract, I get a share of the gas fees that are generated from that. And then we also have a mechanism where we have a community pool where say the top 10 smart contract riders with the highest transactions will actually get a share of that larger community pool. So it's an incentive for, to get people to keep on developing the contracts on the blockchain. But not just that, also for them to get people to use those smart contracts. The idea is that we're basically positioning ourselves as the identity-based blockchain where they can leverage the vault and they can leverage the things that we've built to start building things like DeFi contracts or metaverse gateways or all sorts of things where you may actually require some sort of either full identity or self-sovereign identity or AML or KYC or things like that to gain access to them. So that that's something I'm really excited about. Other closing thoughts, I'm just, for us, 
we've spent a long time like build, building what we've built is really hard and we've taken some wrong turns we've tried to launch some things that haven't been quite fully baked and i'm super super excited for what 2023 holds because we're now at a position where we're getting out to clients we're launching the product we've got the things coming out to market yeah for us this is definitely the year the year where we make our mark Nice. And I love that that is the perfect notes. And it's, I think nobody has like a perfect path from idea inception to yeah. releasing a product. And the fact that, you know, you have taken wrong turns, I think that lends credence to the transparency that you've brought to this episode. Like, yes, you have taken wrong turns, but you're there. You're actually in the destination. It's 2023. Things are happening this year, right? So I'm going to keep my fingers crossed for you. And as usual, right, Tim, your socials, sharing socials will be down in the show notes on the podcast. And I'd love to have you on maybe towards the end of the year so you can say, yes, Korean, this thing is working wonderfully. It's all going well, or it's working like this way, but we've had these issues. I love that you've been so honest about the entire process with us today. And I really appreciate it, Tim. Thank you very much for your time. And hopefully we can talk to you again in a few months time, maybe towards October, November. Awesome. Thanks for your time. It's a great interview. Thank you.